Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Van Dievender Black's presentation on COVID and the workplace. We've given many presentations over the past year on how the pandemic has affected work, and now it's time for another update. Today, we'll be using Microsoft Teams for this presentation. If you wave your mouse around the border of your screen, you'll see a little bubble with a question mark. That's where you can post questions. Just click there and post um, any question you have. We've set aside some time at the end of the presentation to review and answer those questions. Also, this presentation is being recorded and we will provide you with a link to the recording after the presentation. Next slide, please. This is me, I'm Ann Bebo. I'm a partner with the law firm of Ann Diebender Black. I focus my practice on labor and employment law. This is just a short bio about me. You can read more on the firm's website. Next slide, please. And this is my co-presenter today, uh, my partner, Arlene Kleindenst. She's also a partner with Van Dievender Black, and she also focuses her practice on labor and employment law. You can see more information about her background and experience on our website too. Next slide, please. This is an overview of the topics we're gonna cover today. We're gonna talk about vaccines, the new Virginia permanent COVID safety standard, OSHA's guidance on COVID, the current executive order um, from the Virginia governor regarding COVID, and then we're gonna briefly touch on last year's Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Next slide, please. So finally, it appears that we are um, nearing an end to this global nightmare with more and more people getting vaccinated every day. I thought it was funny that in the UK, the second person they vaccinated was named William Shakespeare, showing that they're really prioritizing the elderly over there. He's pushing 500. Here, Virginia is prioritizing its elderly too, so not that old, and also essential workers. Many of you have employees who either have been vaccinated or are eligible for vaccines or soon will be eligible for vaccines. So the question we've been getting a lot lately is once everyone's eligible for vaccines, can we make it mandatory? So in general, yes, employers can mandate that employees get the vaccine, but you do have to make exceptions in two areas. For disability, if an employee has a disability that prevents him or her from having the vaccine, or if the employee has a sincerely held religious belief um, against the vaccination. Next slide. So if an employee says, I can't get the vaccine because of a health reason or disability, the first thing you should do is ask the employee to provide medical documentation showing that he or she has a disability that prevents him or her from getting vaccinated. And then you'll take a look at that and determine if that's, um, if they actually do have a disability, if they really do have medical documentation supporting that. It can't just be, um, you know, that they're nervous about getting a shot. It has to be something more substantial. Religious-based objections are a little more tricky because there's no objective criteria that you can hold up to see if it's a legitimate objection. Essentially, it just has to be a sincerely held religious belief. And that doesn't um, have to be a religion you've ever heard of. It doesn't have to be a established religion or a religion with many adherence besides this one employee. It just has to be this employee's sincerely held religious belief. And the last thing you want to do is get into a religious debate with your employee about what that particular Bible verse means or whatever else they're relying on. So in most cases, when an employee says they have a religious objection, that's probably going to end the inquiry. Nonetheless, it's probably a good idea to ask the employee to explain their objection in writing. You're not going to debate them on that but at least it gives you something to um, for your records to explain why this particular individual isn't getting the shot. Um, but once you have one of those two objections, either a disability-based objection or a religious-based objection, you then have to go through a, an analysis to determine whether this employee can continue to work in his or her current position without a vaccine. Um, and I think this is I don't think we're at this position yet. I don't think we're, we've hit this level with the vaccinations yet. But at some point, when the vaccines are widely enough available, we will have the luxury of being able to decide, can someone continue to work if they're not vaccinated? So 
At that point, you're going to need to assess whether or not the person poses an undue threat to either his or her own health and safety or the health and safety of others by being unvaccinated in the workplace. And also, you're going to need to look at whether you're going to, you would need to accommodate the person, give them a reasonable accommodation by moving them to telework or moving them to another position or another location in your facility where he or she will have limited contact with others. So those, again, are at this point, more hypothetical questions. We haven't quite gotten there, but that's the analysis you're going to get have to go through once we get to that point. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk about Virginia's COVID standard. So earlier this year, Virginia issued the final permanent standard for infectious disease prevention of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. And because that's such a mouthful, I'm just going to call it the COVID standard. Uh, this, if you'll recall back last summer, the um, Virginia Department of Labor and Industry and its agency, Bosch, uh, Virginia Occupational Safety and Health, had issued emergency an emergency temporary standard that went into effect back in July 2020. The permanent COVID standard that just came out earlier this year is only a minor update to that. There are a few changes from the emergency temporary standard, but the bulk of the permanent standard is pretty much the same as the emergency temporary standard. It applies to every employer, employee, and place of employment in Virginia that's within VOSHA's jurisdiction. So that basically means if your work site is not on a military base or a federal enclave, and if your work site isn't private sector maritime employment, waterfront employment, you're going to be subject to VOSH jurisdiction, and that means you're going to be subject to the COVID standard. Even for businesses that have employees that work on um, the base or that work in the waterfront, often they have a, an office that is subject to VOSH jurisdiction. So it's not uncommon for a business to have some of their employees subject to OSHA jurisdiction and some subject to VOSH jurisdiction. Any of your employees are subject to VOSH jurisdiction, or I'm sorry, if you have any employees that are subject to VOSH jurisdiction, then your business does need to comply with this COVID standard. The overall purpose is to establish requirements for employers to control, prevent, and mitigate the spread of COVID-19 at work. In the standard, they talk about SARS-CoV-2, um, as the title uh, indicates, that's the virus that causes COVID-19. I think for most of us that are outside of the healthcare industry, it's a distinction without a difference. And so um, you'll hear me switch back and forth between the terms. And I think for most people, uh, for most purposes, COVID-19 and the virus SARS-CoV-2 is um, indistinguishable for most purposes. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the COVID standard does apply to all employers that are within VOSHA's jurisdiction. Within the standard, there are different requirements depending on the level of risk exposure that your employees are subject to. So the first thing that all businesses have to do, all businesses within VOSHA's jurisdiction, is to classify every job task according to its COVID exposure risk as either very high, high, medium, or lower risk. And I'll talk a little bit in the next slide about what those different categories of risk mean. You all have to inform all employees about COVID and encourage them to self-monitor for symptoms and possible exposure. You have to have policies and procedures for employees to report suspected cases when they think that they have symptoms or they think that they have COVID. You don't want to let anyone on the job site who you either know or suspect um, may have COVID. And if you have any subcontractors or companies that provide labor to your business, you have to let them know of that requirement that they shouldn't allow anyone on the job site who either has COVID or you suspect has COVID. Next slide, please. So these are the employee risk categories. And as I said, you have to look at every job task. So you may have an employee who has um, different tasks, and some of the tasks may be medium exposure risk and others may be lower exposure risk. The um, two highest categories of risk are very high and high. And 
very high, and, and I'm thinking that most of the people on this call probably have employees in the medium and lower exposure risk, so I'll spend a little bit more time on that. But in short, very high is um, employees whose job tasks have a high potential for exposure to known or suspected sources of the virus or to people who are either known or suspected to be infected with the virus. And so examples of that are people who are working in medical procedures, um, doing post-mortem examinations, working on laboratory um, processes that actually involve the virus or suspected cases of the virus. Those people are categorized as very high. High is um, most people in healthcare are probably going to fall under high. That's where the workplace or job task has a high potential for employee exposure inside of six feet with either known or suspected sources of the virus or people who are known or suspected to be infect infected and is not otherwise classified as very high. So again, healthcare is a good example of the high category. Medium is um, a lot more common and medium is where the workplace or job tasks require more than minimal occupational contact inside of six feet with other employees or other people or the general public who may be infected or may not be, but you're not known, but aren't known or suspected to be infected. So one example is construction workers. They often fall into medium because they have to come within six feet of other employees, but they're not being exposed to anyone who has symptoms because you're taking steps to get to get people who have symptoms or are known to be positive out of the workplace. So they're just coming into contact with people who um, are not known or suspected to be infected, but they do come into six feet of contact with those people. Another example would be retail workers, people who are dealing with the general public um, as part of their job duties. So a lot of times supermarket workers, people like that, they're gonna fall under this medium exposure risk because they're, they're having frequent contact within six feet with other people, but those people aren't known or suspected to be infected. Um, lower risk are typically going to be office workers. These are people whose workplace or job tasks involve minimal occupational contact with other employees or other people, um, such as an office building. So these are people who are able to um, set themselves aside during the workday. Maybe they just go into their individual office and other than briefly passing someone else in the hall, they don't really have any face-to-face -face contact with other people. So they're going to be lower. Now, as I said, it's job tasks specific, so not cat, not workplace specific. So you could have a office employee who does have to have a lot of um, contact with people within six feet, and then that office worker would be classified as medium risk. And conversely, you could have someone on a job site in a construction field who has very little contact at all with other people. So for example, an equipment operator who gets into work, gets into the cab of his equipment, stays there all day and then leaves and never comes within six feet of other people, he may actually be lower risk. So you do have to look at every job task individually. And these risk categories are going to dictate what else you have to do under the COVID standard. Next slide, please. So for all employers, regardless of their employee risk categories, you have to establish a system to receive reports of positive tests by employees subcontractors, contract employees, and temps who are present at the work site within two days prior to symptom onset or prior to the positive test result if they're asymptomatic until 10 days after onset or positive test result. I think for many businesses, it makes sense to appoint someone who is going to be your point person. You may need to appoint multiple point people if you have, say, multiple shifts or multiple work locations. You might need to have multiple point people. I've been calling these people your COVID coordinator, but you can call them whatever you want. But that's going to be the person whose job it is to receive the reports of um, someone calling in, I've tested positive, or I've got symptoms, I can't come to work today. And that person should also be in charge of administering your plan or assisting with um, questions employees may have about the plan. You also have to have um, a system in place and follow through on notification. When you find out there's been a positive case at the work site, you have to first notify other employees who may have been exposed. You'll want to interview the employee who's calling in to say, I just tested positive. Find out when that employee was at the work site, which other employees that um, employee came into contact with. Um, and I'm going to talk about exposure, the definition, but who he may have exposed. And that's typically defined as being within six feet of someone for a cumulative 15 minutes over the whole day. 
you have to notify those employees that they may have been exposed. You have to notify other employers who, whose employees were present at the work site at, during the same time. So if it's a work site where you have multiple businesses performing tasks, you have to get in contact with those other employers and let them know we had a person test positive. He was, in the, he was at the job site on Tuesday and tell them where he was on the job site. Um, if the building or facility where your employee was um, after he tested positive or where he was when he was positive with COVID is not owned by you, then you no need to notify the owner of the building. And if you're the owner of the building, you have to notify other tenants so that they can let their employees know. If you've had two or more cases of your own employees testing positive or um, within 14 days, you have to notify the Department of Health, the Virginia Department of Health. And if you have three or more cases of your own employees within 14 days, you also have to notify the Department of Labor and Industry. On the Department of Labor and Industry's website, um, if you follow links through to VOSH, you will see a place on VOSH where you can notify both the Department of Health and DOLI through VOSH's website. Next slide, please. Importantly, when you notify others that an employee has COVID, you cannot reveal the employee's identity. This may at times seem absurd. It may be very obvious who you're talking about. You tell an employee someone you um, were with on Monday has tested positive. We're letting you know you've been exposed. And the employee may respond, the only person I was with on Monday was Bob. It must be Bob. You can't confirm that. Even though it may be obvious it was Bob, don't confirm to the employee who it was that got sick. And again, that's why I think at times this becomes absurd, but that's the rule. Don't, don't reveal the employee's identity. Um, and the same when you're talking to other employers whose employees are present on the work site. Don't reveal that it was Bob who has COVID. Just say someone at the work site had COVID. Um, but when you do make when you do notify the Department of Health and Department of Labor and Industry, they're going to ask for the employee's identity and you do have to provide that information. So that's an exception. You can and, and in fact are required to reveal the employee's identity when you're notifying the Virginia Department of Health or the Department of Labor and Industry. Next slide, please. Some more mandatory requirements. The employees have to have access to their own COVID records. So if you happen to have any records in your possession about your employee's um, history with COVID, you have to make that accessible to those employees so they can get access to their own records. You also have to have return to work procedures and RTW is the abbreviation for return to work. And I'm gonna talk about those in more detail. Next slide, please. So, Here's one place where the permanent COVID standard deviated from the emergency temporary standard. If you'll recall, when the emergency temporary standard came out last summer, it was based on the then existing CDC guidelines about when it was safe to discontinue self-isolation following a bout of COVID. CDC updated its guidance about three days after the Virginia Emergency Temporary Standard was issued. So it was um, quickly out of sync with the CDC guidelines. Well, in, the, in issuing the permanent standard, Bosch updated its return to work rules and now they match the current CDC guidance. So if you're familiar with what the Emergency Temporary Standard said about return to work rules, you can scrap that. We now have different rules about return to work. The new rules, um, and these aren't new if you've been following the CDC guidance because this is what the CDC has been saying since last July, but the new rule under the COVID standard for Virginia is um, if an employee is symptomatic and is either known or suspected to be infected, he or she can return to work when the following three criteria are satisfied and they have to satisfy all three. They have to be fever free for at least 24 hours without fever reducing medicine. There has to be an improvement in their respiratory symptoms, like cough and shortness of breath. And it has to have been at least 10 days since the symptoms first appeared. That's for your symptomatic employees. If the employee is asymptomatic but tested positive, that employee can return to work 10 days after their first positive test result. Note that the COVID standard no longer mentions getting tested, no longer requires or suggests that you require getting your employees tested before they come back to work. Both the CDC and Bosch have moved away from testing 
for return to work purposes. The best practice is not to require that your employees be tested. And the main reason for that is that the test can be misleading in determining whether there's a risk of contagion. I've seen a number of um, situations where an employee has been exposed, he or she immediately gets tested to see if they have it. And often those initial test results come back wrong. So they'll get an initial um, negative test result and lo and behold, five days later, they come down with COVID. So the test can be very misleading depending on when they're administered. So the best practice is not to require your employees get tested before they come back to work because those test results may not be as meaningful as you think they are. Um, but if you do want to require testing, you're allowed to do so. Just keep in mind that you're gonna to have to pay for the test if you require one. Next slide, please. Um, the Virginia COVID standard, interestingly enough, does not address what to do if an employee has been exposed other than tell the employee he's been exposed. That's all the um, standard says is that you have to notify the employee he's been exposed to COVID. And again, the definition of exposure is being within six feet of an infected, per for an infected person for a cumulative 15 minutes during a 24 hour period starting from two days before illness onset or if the person's asymptomatic two days prior to test specimen collection until the time the patient is isolated. So if a person has been exposed in your workplace, you have to tell him he's been exposed, but the Virginia COVID standard doesn't say you have to keep him or her out of work. The CDC guidelines, on the other hand, does recommend that post-exposure individuals self-quarantine for 14 days if they don't have symptoms, unless the local public health department directs that the employee may discontinue quarantine sooner. And if an employee who is in quarantine because of exposure develops symptoms, then you basically go back to the protocol of keeping the person out until, um, as you would as if, if the person has, um, is known or suspected to have uh, COVID. So even though the CDC guidelines um, are not binding, they're not law, it's best practice to follow them. So the Virginia COVID standard, as I said, doesn't say what to do with someone who's been exposed. The best practice though would be to follow the CDC guidelines and direct employees who've been exposed to self-quarantine for 14 days. Stay out for 14 days. If you don't have symptoms, you can come back after the 14 days. If you develop symptoms, then we're going to use the return to work standard that I just discussed in the previous slide. Next slide, please. Some other um, mandatory requirements for all employers in Virginia under the COVID standard. They, the standard says that you need to require six feet of physical distancing where possible, where um, practical. And when physical distancing isn't possible, you should require your employees to wear face coverings. The standard also requires that you put up signage promoting physical distancing. Um, you should limit non-employee access to the workplace. If you have common areas like break rooms, conference rooms, um, kitchens in your workplace, you want to either close those or control access to them. And in controlling access, what you're supposed to do is take a look at the room and decide how many people can safely be in that room at one time. That's gonna be your occupancy limit and you're required to post a sign on the door stating the occupancy limit along with the requirement for physical distancing, the requirement that employees wash their hands and sanitize and that they clean or disinfect shared surfaces. Um, employers are also required to have hand washing facilities or hand sanitizer readily available for the workers. Next slide, please. Shared work vehicles. This was an aspect of the emergency temporary standard that many people found confusing, um, the, what the temporary standard said about sharing work vehicles. So in the permanent COVID standard, Bosch did clarify. So the guidance is a little better with the um, permanent standard. And what the um, permanent standard says is that to the extent possible, employers should eliminate the need to share work vehicles. Obviously that's not possible in all jobs, um, particularly for construction um, workers. There may be situations where you have to share a work vehicle because it's limited access to the site. If you do have to, if your workers do have to share a work vehicle, then you as the employer need to make sure they have fresh air ventilation. Weather permitting, that could be as simple as rolling down the windows. If it's um, 
if that doesn't make sense because it's a cold and rainy day like today, then you need to make sure that the fresh air is circulating in the car. You know, if you're familiar, usually your um, car dashboard has a button where you can recirculate the air within the car. You want that off so that fresh air is circulating, the car is pulling in fresh air. Um, you want to maximize separation between employees and the vehicle. So if the vehicle normally can accommodate six people, only have three people in it, for example, um, have your people sitting in separate rows to the extent possible in the car and just space people out. You don't want to pack people in like in this picture here. Also, the standard says that once they become readily available, you need to provide your employees with N95 filtering face piece respirators whenever they share a vehicle. Currently, they're not readily available, so the standard says until they become readily av available, provide face coverings to your employees to wear when they have to share a work vehicle. Next slide, please. Face coverings. The um, standard better, the permanent standard better defines what a face covering is to be acceptable. And the permanent standard says it has to be at least two layers of washable, breathable fabric. It needs to fit snugly against the sides of the face without any gaps. It has to cover the nose and the mouth, and it has to fit securely under the chin. Neck gaiters are fine if they're folded to make two layers. Um, importantly, the permanent standard clarifies that face shields, like in that picture I have on the screen, are not allowed. Those are not a substitute for face coverings. If an employee wants to wear one over top of their face covering, that may be fine, but that is not a substitute for a face covering. Um, and then the other no-no that they pointed out are the face masks that have vents, like in the picture on the right. Those vents, um, exhalation vents or valves, are essentially little doors that let the virus just dance in and out. So they are completely useless. And the standard says, don't even bother, don't wear those. Those are not considered acceptable face coverings. Next slide, please. So there are exceptions to wearing a face covering. If the employee has a disability, if, they're, if they produce documentation that it would be contrary to their health or safety because of some medical condition to wear the face covering, then you can't make them wear the face covering. Now that doesn't um, accept them from the requirement to comply with any um, personal protective equipment or respiratory protection standards that are applicable to your industry. But in terms of the face covering required by the um, Virginia COVID standard, if they have a health issue, they, that might be an excuse for them not to wear one, but you might need to put them in a different position as an accommodation in that search situation. The standard also points out that the employee may have a religious objection. In that case, they have to file a re request for a religious waiver, and that's going to have to be approved by the Department of Labor and Industry. So that really kicks it up a level. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass the baton on to Arlene. You can go to the next slide, please. Hello. The next slide is uh, going into a little bit more detail about medium exposure risk requirements. And if you remember from earlier, a medium exposure job task, and remember you don't classify employees as having medium or high or very high or even jobs as having high, medium, very high. You classify each task as having a level of exposure. So medium tasks, the medium exposure risk requirement, this is when the workplace or job task requires more than minimal contact inside of six feet with other employees, other persons, or the general public. And as Ann said before, uh, this the most common example is construction or um, retail somewhere where or restaurants that sort of job environment so what you're required to do by the virginia covid standard is uh, use engineering controls to either ensure that you have good air handling um, where feasible increase that airflow supply or where feasible install physical barriers also you should uh, use administrative and work practice controls. So here you want to provide face coverings to suspected to be infected non-employees. Um, 
implement flexible work sites or work hours, um, uh, do scheduling uh, changes to uh, minimize the extent that your employees are going to come within six feet of each other, that sort of thing. Uh, PPE is another area where if you have tasks that have medium exposure, you have to uh, assess and provide PPE um, in accordance with the industry requirement. You also have to make written certification of workplace hazard assessment, including identifying work, um, uh, the workplace and um, you know, the dates that you did the hazard assessment. So if you have medium exposure categories of work tasks, make sure that uh, either within your plan um, or some in some other fashion, you have made a written certification that you've done a hazard assessment of that task. Next slide, please. OK, so what is your infectious disease preparedness and response plan for you, those of you who had to do this back in um, July, August when this the temporary standard first came out? Um, this is old hat to you, but if you have any tasks that are very high or high, you must have a written plan. If you have any tasks that are medium exposure and you have 11 or more employees, you must have a written plan. If you only have tasks, only have employees who, who are performing tasks that are low exposure risk, then you do not have to have a written plan. If um, you're finding out for the first time, oh, we have medium or more and we have more than 11 employees, but we don't have a plan. Well, then my recommendation is you should create a plan <laughs> and um, there are instructions for that on the Vosh website. There are sample plans that you can use on the Vosh website. You can ask your lawyer or your safety consultant to prepare a plan for you, but you are required to have a written plan if you don't already have one. Now this standard was made permanent as we've said back in January. Um, so even though COVID may go away or may may come under control the end of this year or next year, um, this this standard is permanent. So you're going to have to have a plan unless the legislature uh, or the Department of Labor um, discontinues or deactivates this um, this standard. So until further notice, you you are required to have this written plan uh, if you fall into one of these requirements. Now, uh, key parts of your plan are that you have to identify a person who's responsible for the implementation. Generally, that will be your safety director or your HR director or somebody who has uh, responsibility for safety in the workplace. Um, you have to provide employee involvement in the development of your plan. So if somebody drafts it for you or you use the plan that's online, uh, make sure you run it by employees and let your actual employees who will be working under this plan uh, comment on whether certain things are feasible or realistic. Um, other things that you should have in the plan are uh, contingency plans for situations that may arise if you have an outbreak. Identify basic infection prevention measures, uh, provide notification uh, plans or procedures, and um, also identify mandatory and non-mandatory recommendations in the CDC guidelines um, or in your the VOSH guidance. Next slide. Training. This is another requirement uh, as of last uh, July when the temporary standard first went into effect. Uh, training is required of all your employees if you have any job tasks that are either classified very high, high or medium exposure risk. So if you have any tasks that require your employees to work within six feet 
of each other for more than 15 minutes aggregate, then you must do this training. Again, if you haven't done it to date, um, there's still time. You should still do it, even though hopefully we're on the downside of the COVID um, pandemic. Um, you should still do this training and document the training. The training must include uh, the COVID standard requirements under the Virginia standard. It has to include the methods of disease transmission, signs and symptoms, risk factors, um, the awareness of uh, the ability of pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic persons to transmit the disease and safe and healthy work practices. It has to address, the training has to address PPE and anti-discrimination provisions, and it has to address your um, uh, plan, your exposure plan, uh, what I just talked about. So how do you do this training? Uh, there is on the VOSH website, the Department of Virginia Department of Labor and Industry website, there is a PowerPoint presentation um, that satisfies the training requirement under the VOSH standard, under the COVID standard. So you can use that and have all your employees uh, watch that PowerPoint, but you must have a trainer, somebody within your organization that answers questions, is available to answer questions about the training and to certify that the employee completed the training. And you must keep those records on hand in case uh, there is an investigation or a complaint uh, and the Department of Labor and Industry investigator comes calling. So you must document that training. Um, it's also a good thing to do be, uh, besides being required by the law. If you have any tasks with medium exposure um, or greater. Next slide. OK, as I just said, you must have a written uh, certificate of the records um, that the employee um, attended the training. You have to have either the physical signature or electronic signature, the date of the training, the name of the person conducting the training. Uh, or if it's all computer based, you have to have the name of the person who prepared the training materials. As I said, I recommend that you have a trainer who also is available even if you use the computer based training and you list the name of the person or the company that prepared the training. I recommend you have an actual trainer person available to answer questions and certify that the training did take place. Uh, retraining is required by the standard. If an employer has reason to believe um, that any person trained is not following the training or doesn't understand the training. Um, obviously, this will go on a case-by-case um, -case basis. If you do have reason to believe that somebody's not following the training, you need to retrain them and document that you retrain them. Uh, next slide. This is important and this has to go in your plan and it has to go in your training. There is uh, or there can be no discrimination of any kind, no discharge uh, of employees who have exercised their rights under this Virginia COVID uh, safety standard. This sort of reiterates the anti-retaliation provisions that already exist in the Virginia state law, uh, state safety and health standards, and also in the federal OSHA standards, uh, there is already an anti-retaliation provision. So uh, this COVID standard in Virginia just uh, takes that a step further and says anybody who, um, who exercises their rights under the standard can't be retaliated against because they exercise those rights. You also cannot discriminate against employees who voluntarily provide and wear their own PPE. So somebody, let's say your, your company provides face shields, face coverings, and somebody wants to wear their own. They don't want to wear the one provided by the company. As long as the employee's own PPE creates an equivalent or greater 
um, protection, you have to let the employee wear their own PPE and you can't discriminate against somebody because they want to wear their own PPE. I haven't heard of this happening anywhere, but conceivably it could. Uh, now, as Ann said, some of the PPP, uh, the face shield, um, would not provide the same amount of covering. So you don't have to allow your employee to, uh, to wear a face shield, um, but you can't discriminate against them because they asked to wear a face shield instead of a face covering. So there's a fine line there where you can, you can require employees to wear face coverings that comply with the standard but because they ask or because they want to wear their own different PPE that doesn't provide coverage, uh, you don't have to agree to that. You just can't discriminate against them because they, they ask the question. Also, anybody who raises a reasonable concern about infection control, infection control, I should say, you cannot discriminate against somebody because they raise safety concerns. Again, that mirrors what's already there under federal and state law about uh, uh, anti-retaliation protections. So somebody who, who believes that you as the employer are not following the COVID standard or that there's an employee or there's a, you know, somebody who's in your workplace who's making it dangerous uh, in terms of COVID spread, and they complain you cannot discriminate against them because they raise that concern, even if their concern is not valid. Um, so you have somebody who's ultra sensitive or ultra vigilant, who is um, constantly coming to you and saying, oh, there's, you know, there's a risk there. Somebody's spreading COVID, somebody's spreading germs. You've investigated and their concern really is, uh, does not have merit. Um, that's okay. You still cannot discriminate against them or discharge them because they raised reasonable concerns. If they reasonably believe there was uh, an increase of uh, risk of spread. Remember that employees can refuse uh, to work or enter a location if the employee feels uh, that the situation or the workplace is unsafe. Of course, if that if the employer investigates and confirms that there is no safety concern and requires the employee uh, to, to work there after all precautions are taken and the employer is uh, complying with all safety standards, including the COVID, Virginia COVID standard, then the employee must comply or you could discipline them. Uh, but you cannot uh, discriminate against them or discipline them just because they make that initial refusal to work because they believe it's unsafe. Next slide. Okay, so as Ann mentioned earlier, OSHA issued a guidance on January 29th. Remember this OSHA guidance, the federal guidance, is just that, a guidance. It's not a new law, it's not a new regulation, so it's a suggestion, just like the CDC guidelines are suggestions. They're not um, mandatory requirements, but as you can see, the OSHA recommendations pretty much uh, parrot what the Virginia COVID standard says, and the Virginia COVID standard is law and must be complied with. So I'm not going to read through all these. Uh, they're all uh, self-explanatory and they're all contained really within the Virginia COVID standard that we've been talking about. Next slide. More OSHA recommendations. Again, uh, these are OSHA recommendations that you communicate effectively with, work with workers in language they understand. Uh, that applies to all OSHA safety regulations and state safety regulations. If you have Spanish speaking or some other language um, that your employees speak, you must uh, provide the safety standards and the safety policies in the language they understand. 
uh, you must educate and train your workers on COVID policies. Again, that's an OSHA recommendation, but it's uh, a Virginia requirement. If you have Virginia, if you have work sites in Virginia that come under uh, Bosch, uh, Virginia Department of Labor and Industry jurisdiction. And as Ann said earlier at the beginning of this presentation, that means all Virginia work sites, unless it's a maritime work site or it's on a federal enclave or federal property uh, where the work site is. Uh, OSHA also recommends that you minimize the negative impact of quarantine on employees. So they're recommending but not requiring that you allow employees to telework where possible or provide paid leave. Again, it's recommending but not requiring. Uh, it's recommending that you clean and disinfect if a person suspected to be infected was in the workplace. Also provide guidance on screening and testing. Next slide. Again from OSHA and um, uh, this part is a requirement. OSHA has the 300 log that's required for employers to record uh, work related injuries or illnesses that cause any medical treatment or days away from work, any medical treatment other than first aid. That's the, the test for recording on your OSHA 300 log. Either it causes lost time from work or requires medical treatment beyond first aid. Then you must record it. Remember, there's a difference between recording work-related injuries or illnesses and reporting work-related injuries or illnesses. So you must report to OSHA either a, fac a fatality or a hospitalization of one or more employees, and that's admission to the hospital, not treatment in the ER if the person is discharged and not admitted. So if you have somebody who's sick due to COVID, um, they get sick at work, it is work related, um, and they are hospitalized, then you have to report that to OSHA. Now remember, it must be work related. So um, there are specific requirements under uh, the OSHA regulations um, for work related illnesses and um, you have to in a lot of cases you're going to have to do some investigation on your own to determine if the COVID infection was work related or not. Nine times out of ten I believe most employees who contract COVID it's not going to be work related. However, if you have three, four employees on a construction crew that test positive, uh, all from that same crew, and uh, you do your investigation, your due diligence, and that employee was not, didn't travel elsewhere, didn't just come back from a vacation somewhere, um, then most more likely than not, it's going to be work related. And you may have to file workers comp uh, uh, report on that infection as well. So again, remember there's a difference between recording and reporting. There's also the protection against retaliation. I mentioned that earlier. That is a OSHA requirement. Just uh, it's the law, not just a suggestion. Um, you also should allow an anonymous process for employees to voice concerns about COVID hazards. Um, that you, you're not required to set up an anonymous hotline. That is a, a guidance, a suggestion. Another suggestion is make the vaccine available at no cost to employees. OSHA's suggesting that, recommending that, but not requiring it. Um, OSHA is again suggesting that workers who are vaccinated should still follow protective measures. And remember, when you look at the requirements of the 
Virginia COVID standard, those requirements don't change once somebody's vaccinated. You must still follow those requirements in the Virginia COVID uh, standard. And of course, comply with applicable OSHA standards, the general duty clause. Uh, employers have a general duty under OSHA law to keep a safe workplace. And that's where OSHA, when it does an inspection or responds to a COVID complaint, they're going to look at the general duty clause. And did you as the employer uh, take all reasonable steps to keep that workplace safe? And if you follow the Virginia COVID standard, uh, that's going to show that you did. Next slide. Uh, just uh, this month, OSHA uh, published this national emphasis program and it's going to focus on high hazard industry. OSHA is going to target these establishments uh, that have, in their view, an increased potential exposure to COVID. Uh, they're going to target those workplaces for inspection. Uh, next slide. Here are the primary targets. These, obvious, these are pretty obvious healthcare, nursing homes, meat processing, supermarkets, restaurants, and prisons, correctional institutions. Secondary targets, construction, manufacturing, and urban transit systems. Uh, keep in mind that OSHA uh, also responds to complaints. Usually they're anonymous complaints. So if you do have an, an OSHA inspect, inspector at your door, whether it's from uh, VOSH or from OSHA, it's probably the result of a complaint rather than uh, one of these targeted inspections. Uh, but if you are, if your um, organization is in one of these primary targets, uh, you should be ready. Next slide. Virginia Executive Order 72. Um, this was last updated uh, January 24th, I'm sorry, February 24th. It remains in full force and effect. And keep in mind, all public and private in-person social gatherings are still limited to 10 people indoors, 25 people outdoors. Those are social gatherings. Uh, you may remember that Governor Northam went, uh, did a press conference around the 25th of February and changed the rules for entertainment and for curfews and for alcohol starting uh, March 1. But those are for entertainment venues. So entertainment inside is 30% or up to a maximum of 250 people. Entertainment outside is 30% or up to a maximum of 1,000. Alcohol can now be served up until midnight, um, or I'm sorry, up until, um, no, it is midnight. And it, wa it was 10 p.m. before, <laughs> for those of you who may be in the, the entertainment industry or the restaurant industry, um, curfew, there was a midnight curfew, now there's no curfew. So those things did change March 1, but it doesn't change what's on this slide. Uh, next slide. Okay, the FFCRA or FICRA, somebody, some people call it, the Family's First Coronavirus Response Act. We have a few more days, a week and a half, I guess, or two weeks left until March 31st when um, this law will be over. Um, keep in mind that it did expire January, or I'm sorry, December 31st of 2020, unless you as the employer could voluntarily decide to continue it through the end of March of 2021. If you didn't voluntarily continue it, then it's over and done with. You're no longer required to grant this type of leave. Um, if you are, if you did extend it 
um, you can take the tax credits. You can still take the tax credits for any money you paid to employees under either the emergency paid sick leave law, which requires you to give full pay uh, for certain categories of absence related to COVID or two thirds pay for other um, uh, for other types of absences up to 80 hours or if you have somebody whose son or daughter um, daycare or um, school was closed due to COVID, uh, they were allowed to take 12 weeks, up to 12 weeks of um, paid leave at two thirds pay under the EFMLA. All of that money that you paid under either of those two provisions, requirements, um, can be used as a tax credit, um, but you you must have documentation. That's why we recommend that you um, use use a leave form when employees are taking this type of leave and require them to bring you documentation that their child's school was closed uh, or that um, they tested positive for COVID or had a um, a positive uh, diagnosis from a healthcare provider that they had COVID or they sought um, uh, sought treatment from a healthcare provider because they had COVID symptoms for all of those reasons. Uh, next slide. Questions. I know we've got a bunch of questions on the queue and uh, Ann and I have been publishing responses to those questions and we'll open it up. We're just about out of time and I don't know if Ann, you want to jump back on? Sure, yeah, there, there's some questions here that, um, so as Arlene said, we've both been answering them as we go along, but there's still some out here that we haven't answered yet and I thought maybe Arlene and I could tackle them together. There are several questions along the same lines about the OSHA log um, and I'm just going to read the one from Paul Havilis, but a few people posed the same question. How are we supposed to know that the employee contracted COVID at work? No one can identify the point of infection. Um, Arlene, I'm interested to hear your views, but I, I think it's one of those fact and circumstances situation where you're just going to interview the employee and see if it appears that that's where they contracted it. What do you think, Arlene? Right now, I agree 100%. That's going to depend on the specific facts of the situation. Uh, and you can ask, you can ask the employee, well, where did you go? What did you do? Uh, when did you first have symptoms? When, you know, did you get tested? Did you not get tested? Were you um, at an event or at a, you know, at somebody's house who tested positive? You can ask all those questions and, and then you just make your best judgment based on all those facts and what happened in your workplace. If you had nobody else who ever tested positive at your workplace and that person, you know, always wore a mask, never got within six feet of anybody, then chances are that was not a, a work-related case and you do not have to put it on your OSHA log. Right. Um, the next question is, if you require a worker to wear an N95 while driving, I believe they fall on the mandatory OSHA respiratory standard. I think that's correct. You know, Arlene, isn't um, an N95 mask, does that fall under the, um, the well, PPE standards? Yeah, just because they're driving in a in a car to go to a job site, that doesn't qualify as a respirator, um, a mandatory OSHA respirator. Um, event. So it's um, mandatory respirator programs under OSHA have very specific um, workplace um, or work, work site um, specifications. What I'm trying to say is, is the person exposed to asbestos? Is the person exposed to lead paint? Is the person working in a confined space? is the person working in welding or uh, cutting areas in a shop. So all those specific jobs and specific industries will then have uh, respirator requirements. So just driving in a, riding in a car or driving in a car to a work site with another person, um, that doesn't fall under any other 
OSHA uh, rule for respirators. So, so this is this is something that's just unique to the Virginia COVID standard, the um, requiring the N95 when you're in a car. Um, and I know I've seen a lot of a lot of stuff on the internet and on the news about fake N95 uh, masks. So um, the the real N95 masks have a NIOSH stamp, N-I-O-S-H. Um, so make sure if if you've got that that you're using the right thing. Um, let's see. Uh... One question here. I'm not sure I quite understand it. So does this mean that wearing just one properly fitted mask is no longer legal or in compliance in the state of Virginia? Um, if I understand the question correctly, I think that's wrong. Uh, wearing one properly fitted mask would be compliant um, under the COVID standard. That's all it requires. Maybe this person was talking about the two layers um, that's required for a face mask to be um, considered uh, compliant, but it that it's still just one mask. It's just supposed to be made of two layers. Right. Right, I agree. Uh, let's see. I know there's a question about does this presentation cover travel restriction protocol for employers and uh, we haven't really talked about that and the Virginia COVID standard doesn't address travel restrictions for employers and I think for that you just follow CDC guidelines and um, use your best judgment on whether you're going to restrict your employees from traveling. Okay. And I think that's it for the questions and we're out of time at this point. So thank you everyone for tuning in and um, as I said, you'll be provided a copy of the presentation. Yes, thank you very much. Great, bye. Bye-bye.